This quote by Hugh Nibley sums up the, pre the premise of my presentation today, um, and that is that America has bought into a marketing lie. I happen to be a former art director for an advertising agency, and I have seen firsthand how marketing tactics work. Over the past 70 years, we have remade our education system to suit this marketing lie, and it is, we need to align our educations to the needs of the workforce. This marketing lie makes parents look at their children like they're commodities instead of blessings. And it makes state leaders look at them as future deficits or assets for the economy. This marketing is hogwash. <laughs> um, it needs to be challenged. And as Hugh Nibley indicates, it needs to be challenged not just for the sake of preserving individual agency, but for the pre preserving our country itself. The sole reason we have reoriented our education system is to enrich big business in big with big government. Our era just happens to be the era of big technology, big testing, and big data. In our era, this marketing lie has more power than ever before to control people's lives, their educations, and their behaviors. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here today to talk about the reality of this. I want to thank Oak um, for the, being the person that he is. I met Oak four years ago um, due to some things that were going on in my school district, Canyon School District, and I want him to know how much I appreciate sorry, his good spirit and his good heart and his desires to be good and do good, um, not just for his own family, but for all of our families. Recently, LDS singer-songwriter Jenny Phillips decided to start talking about why she became a homeschool mom. And she's a very powerful speaker, and she talks about the heart. And she shared a personal story, and I'm not going to go into that, but just about something she experienced with her eight-year-old daughter after school one day, which made her realize that school was not teaching her children the values that she wanted them to have, and in fact was teaching them anti-family values. And so um, in the process of um, doing her homeschool, she developed a curriculum called uh, The Good and the Beautiful. And um, this is a picture of it. This is um, her attempt at helping others recognize um, what we have lost in our education system, the, the good values and the good books that are missing. So you are likely here today because you also recognize some of these things and you want something better for your children and grandchildren. I hope today that I can paint a little bit of a picture of what's happening with America's education system and um, talk a little bit about the people who've assumed power over our education system. A few years ago, a friend of mine who is a reporter in Salt Lake City uh, was asked uh, by the LDS Church to go and cover the humanitarian efforts of the LDS Church after the uh, tsunami in Japan in 2012. And after she came home, um, she met with a group of us in the neighborhood just to kind of share some of her stories about, just incredible stories about uh, the relief that they were able to provide for the citizens of Japan. And one of the stories that she shared was um, of working alongside the United Nations workers. And one day, uh, United Nations leader turned to her and said, I just don't understand it. We come into these countries after these disasters and we provide so much relief and so many tools and skills for these people to be able to uh, remain self-reliant when we leave. And for some reason, the things that you do that the LDS Church puts into place always seem to last, but the things that we do don't. And I can't figure out why. And so when my neighbor was sharing this with us, she said that she had this thought, but she didn't share it with this UN leader. But her thought was, it's because you don't turn them towards God first. Last year, a South Korean exchange student at an LDS private school in American Fork gave her senior thesis on Common Core. She had come to the school as a junior and in front of her entire class and a group of judges, uh, this beautiful girl presented um, her exceptional research on Common Core. 
I felt that she was giving her presentation as a witness and a warning to Americans about not following in South Korea's footsteps. She talked about how she had come to realize that South Korea teaches children to reach a standard. All the focus is on standards and testing. She said that this approach has had the effect of orienting their entire education system and country towards materialism and consumerism. She said that children were made to feel like their whole life depended on achieving the next standard and that this left no time for teachers to teach anything else. She talked about how they're not taught to read whole books of great literature, but rather informational texts so that they'll be college and career ready. After being at this private LDS school where whole works of literature are studied, sometimes probably agnosium for some students, um, she had come to realize that she had been deprived of two things by the informational text approach to education. The first was she had never been able to recognize that she had a place in history. And second, she had never realized that education was about becoming a better person and fulfilling her life mission. As a side note, this beautiful girl joined the LDS Church last year and is now pursuing the process of what she be called becoming a better person. She helped many people see that the idea of a common core is not isolated to America. And my purpose here today is to show how common core is taking hold globally as the economy and test scores reign supreme. This is a man named Andreas Slicer. I'm sure he's a well-meaning man, but I believe he has too much power over the global testing market. He is a German statistician and the head of the international assessments known as PISA, the Program for International Assessments. These are the international assessments that compare student test scores from countries that are part of the United Nations. President Obama's Race to the Top program helped the global education and testing giant, Pearson, take over the PISA exams this year. PISA exams are now Common Core exams. This means that Common Core is a global education endeavor. It also means that when you hear legislators talk about how dismal our test scores are on PISA and that we need to change those scores to compete in the global economy, that these same legislators have bought into another marketing lie. This lie will keep us locked into a Common Core chokehold. PISA and its Common Core collaborators are moving states in America toward using new assessment systems called next generation or 21st century assessments. I'm going to share a quote by a group called the Gordon Commission that was established in 2011. This commission was created with funding funneled from the U.S. Department of Education um, through the, what's called the Educational Testing Service. Um, and their purpose is to push states and children away from using standardized assessments and into online learning assessments embedded in learning platforms. I have shared this quote with several key legislators in Utah over the past two years and none of them have seemed particularly concerned about it. But since you're here today, I, I would like to share it with you and, and I think that you will be. In their report, the Gordon Commission states, the Common Core Standards and the rethinking of assessment they are fostering give us the opportunity to challenge the deeply held belief in local control. Does that quote shock anyone here? When I first read it, knowing who some of the people are on the commission who have great power over state's digital learning and teaching policies, I was shocked. How is that possible? How can a simple set of standards eliminate local education control? And the answer is that standards can't, but next generation assessments tied to those standards can. Next generation assessments are formative assessments, online constant assessments hidden in learning platforms, also called stealth or embedded assessments. They are being sold to states as the answer to minimize the impacts of too many standardized assessments on children. But that was all pre-planned. Remember, this is marketing. 
The way that next generation assessments eliminate local control is that all the data runs from third party platforms through state longitudinal data systems all the way to the US Department of Education so that instructional requirements can be made of teachers in schools based on a child's daily online work. So the Gordon Commission knew something that most parents and local school board members didn't. The standards aren't just standards, they are a means to an end. They are the tool that has fostered the remaking of assessments for every local school and for every child and every student, including higher ed in the nation. And Utah passed a resolution to get us into stealth testing last legislative session. Most of you are familiar with No Child Left Behind. Why were so many parents and teachers and administrators and education leaders frustrated by No Child Left Behind? Because of its controlling nature, the way that No Child Left Behind controlled local schools was by tying federal requirements to what's known as the federal tripod. Standards, test, and accountability. Now to persuade state governors and congressional leaders into new federal reforms, they are being sold a new marketing lie. The lie is competency-based education and personalized learning platforms will restore local education control. How do we know this is a lie? because competency-based education <clears throat> is still tied to the federal tripod. And here's what it looks like. As states, <clears throat> excuse me, begin moving into competency-based education or personalized learning tied to Common Core standards, this federal tripod doesn't change, it just morphs into a global, technologically driven tripod. Common Core standards ties, uh, or comp become competency standards daily online embedded assessments in curriculum, and teachers, schools, and children assessed on global values. So not to be too grim, but this is how I see it. <laughs> we have people in our congressional delegation that believe that the upcoming reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act will restore local education control, but it's just not the case. And because of what, and it's because of what Race to the Top has done to, um, through Common Core funding, to testing. The Obama administration used Race to the Top to bring together two global technology standard setting organizations, the CIF Association and a group called IMS Global Learning Consortium. The CIF Association is a Bill Gates group. Gates, as you know, is the largest funder of Common Core. What these groups did was that they created a set of common education data standards. They created these data standards to make computer adaptive assessments interoperable among learning and testing platforms. So a state or local district thinks that they have hired a particular testing company with certain values, but really they have lost control over what is taught and tested and what drives local education decisions. This means that parents won't have any idea where learning and testing items are coming from when their children are online, on learning platforms at school or even at home because the assessments are adaptive and change depending on the student's last answer. The common education data standards tie competencies to common core standards. We're going to get into who's controlling competency and what it means in a minute, but for now just keep in mind that next generation assessments track untolds of amounts of data about our children. Newton, a key technology partner with the US Department of Education, claims that they can track 10 million data points per day per child using computer adaptive assessments and learning platforms. Excuse me. <clears throat> in light of what the Gordon Commission said about dismantling local education control, it's easy to see that we're about to replace our representative form of government with a global governance structure controlled by an elite group of technocrats. How many learning and testing groups do you think are using the federally funded common education data standards so that learning and testing platforms can be interoperable. Probably only a handful, right? Actually, over 300 learning and testing groups are already using the common education data standards. This was because the feds, using race to the top, essentially forced anyone who wasn't using the data standards out of the education market. As far as I can tell, there are very few learning platforms or assessment platforms in Utah or in America that aren't using the common education data standards. 
Now let's take a look at who's defining the kind, defining the kind of competencies that align to next generation assessments. It's not what we in Utah currently consider to be competency-based education or personalized learning. A group called Knowledge Works, also a Bill Gates funded group, published two policy briefs in 2013. They state that race to the top reforms laid the groundwork for a shift to competency-based education. The reforms were adopt common core standards, build data systems to support next generation assessments, and use those assessments to drive what teachers teach. A group called EdSteps, another Gates funded group, worked with the Columbia Teachers College and the Council of Chief State School Officers, which is the Superintendents Club. And this is their definition of competencies tied to Common Core. Global competency is rooted in our changing reality and is constantly evolving with the world. This definition of competency appears to be focused more on secular humanism and moral relativity than academics. Then they continue. At its core, global competency is the disposition and capacity to understand and act on issues of global significance. So we see that social justice will be the main focus of competency-based education. You will not be surprised to know that the issues of global significance have already been predetermined. They are those things found in the UN's Millennial Development Goals which are things like reaching gender, uh, gender equity, solving climate change, and working towards population control. How will next generation assessments help children toward thinking in these terms? By assessing values, attitudes, and beliefs, not just academics. My husband and I should be the ones deciding what values our children will be taught, what attitudes they should espouse, and what standards of behavior we want them to uphold. Schools are supposed to be teaching academics. But if we're in a globalized world, as we're told over and over, then we must acquiesce to the needs of the collective. Knowledge Work said that competency-based competency education is about creating an individualized learning path for each child. Again, it's a marketing lie. Personal learning entails that a trusted and caring teacher who knows a child well creates projects of intellectual discovery that reflect the child's unique needs or interests. Personalized learning entails adjusting the difficulty level of a prefabricated skill or competency-based exercise based on a student's test scores. It requires, as one person said, the purchase of software from one of those companies that can afford full-page ads in Education Week. So let's move now from assessments to learning platforms and see what's happening to curriculum control in America. Here is Steve Midgley. He's the Deputy Director of Education Technology for the U.S. Department of Education. I'm not going to play his video, but this is a video of him talking about the White House's online learning registry, which was created in 2011. This is a White House online learning registry not the U.S. Department of Education per se. Mr. Midgley says that the White House's online learning registry helps content and information get between websites. This is in order to filter the curriculum that reaches teachers and tracks what they use. Here is a graphic he uses to show how the White House's online learning registry works. It essentially operates like a data broker. Once the U.S. Department of Education knows what resources teachers are using, they can use the data to retrain or replace teachers. Utah's master technology plan ensures that federal school turnaround experts are hired in our local schools to train teachers to use data to improve instruction. Data-driven decision-making is quickly becoming a local school mantra, but parents and local board members should know that it's a federal mantra. Steve Midgley helped the U.S. Department of Education and the Federal Communications Commission change broadband internet regulations. This was part of net neutrality to get federally sanctioned curriculum into every child's classroom. Did you know that net neutrality was really about globalizing curriculum? Where are the media stories about this? Isn't the federal government legally barred from controlling curriculum, let alone finding out what curriculum teachers are using and working to change it? What values will this curriculum contain and how will parents know what's being taught and tested? <clears throat> Last month, 
the eighth grade history teachers at my local middle school, gave students a new perspective on Columbus Day. Teachers played an online video for students that for the most part portrayed Columbus as a racist tyrant who murdered and pillaged the Native Americans. Then students were asked to take a survey about whether they thought we should celebrate Columbus Day anymore. As one mom told me, her child came home confused and essentially indoctrinated. When I personally emailed the school principal, his email response was very kind but clear. The lesson met the common core standards for social studies. I was left thinking, is it more important to meet a standard imposed from outside our local community than it is to teach a child to sustain the values of their parents? I also wondered what will happen to religious liberty if children are taught to agitate against their parents' religious beliefs. <clears throat> Here's where Utah's master, uh, master Technology Plan comes in. Utah State School Board recently unveiled their Master Technology Plan. Their website touts adoption of the nation's first statewide digital teaching and learning master plan as if, hey, we're leading the country. They claim that it's a Utah plan, but the main advisors to the state school board are from Common Sense Education, whose founder, James Steyer, was handpicked by the White House to rate curriculum and help federally sanctioned curriculum rise to the top when teachers search resources online. In 2012, the White House hosted something called Data Palooza. Here's a slide grab of the Utah Education Network's digital media specialist, Katie Garrett, speaking there. The U Utah Education Network, also known as UEN, partnered with the White House's Learning Registry in 2011. In this video, Ms. Garrett says that Utah uses the Learning Registry because YouTube blocks online content. So the Learning Registry creates bridges that connect teachers to content. Keep in mind that the UEN delivers curriculum content to both K-12 schools and schools of higher ed. Ms. Garrett's involvement at the White House's Data Palooza is an example of a well-meaning young person having no concept that the federal government and the White House is legally barred from controlling curriculum. And apparently, the Utah Education Network doesn't realize that either. So let's get this straight. Net neutrality was not about a free and open internet, and internet broadband in every school was not about improving student learning. It was a planned strategy to tie all online learning from pre-K to death to common education data standards and to move K through 12 and higher ed into competency-based education. Let's go back to Mr. Slicer for a minute. Who is he advising on next generation assessments? It turns out he's advising the National Conference of State Legislators. This is where our state legislators go to meet around the country on talk, to talk about uh, policy changes. Other international advisors to the National Conference of State Legislators are Mark Tucker, who is infamous for writing a letter to Hillary Clinton in the 90s that now sits in the congressional record. Congressman Bob Schaefer put it into the record in 1998 so that America would not go down Mr. Tucker's intended path that moves America into a technological education system that controls learning through a network of labor market boards. Also in the advisory group, and this is the educational advisory group um, at the National Conference of State Legislators. So also in that group is Linda Darling Hammond. She sits on the Gordon Commission. Remember the Gordon Commission? And their earlier quote about challenging local education control with new kinds of assessments. 28 legislators are being advised by these globalists. One of those legislators is our own well-respected Howard Stevenson, who brought Utah its digital teaching and learning legislation. While I know and trust that Senator Stevenson's intentions are good, I do not agree with the educational objectives of those advising him at the National Conference of State Legislators. These objectives should be shared and debated openly. Someone else advised the National Conference of State Legislators as well. 
Bill Gates spoke to them in 2009 and said, when the tests are aligned to the Common Core standards, the curriculum will line up as well. So he knew that next generation assessments could globalize the world's education system. Did parents know? Not so much. I was actually grateful to see a recent executive order from the governor of Colorado, not because it's a good executive order, but because it, it makes clear for parents and the average person where federal education policies are pushing our local schools. It reads that they are about to implement a digital badging system to adjust curriculum in real time as the market demands shift. That explains competency-based education from the global perspective in a nutshell. Digital badging means that every child will have every one of their competencies or skills attached to a digital badge, a sort of Skinnerian-based gold star reward system for achieving a certain skill that can guide children towards certain workforce tracks. Does that sound like America or individual freedom? To me, it sounds like indoctrination and fascism. A system where the federal government's crony partners decide what opportunities my children will receive. So we're back to this question. Are we embracing global values for education or local values? I'm going to give you a timeline of events and see what you think. As we go through this timeline, ask, are we embracing humanity or humanism? In 1949, the United Nations Education Division, now known as UNESCO, published a packet that read, as long as the child breathes the poisoned air of nationalism, education in world-mindedness can only produce precarious results. It is frequently the family that infects the child with extreme nationalism. The school should therefore use the means described earlier to combat family attitudes. In 1984, UNESCO published their methodological guide to the notion of a common core. It outlines the implementation of a common approach to global education that would train students how to think and behave in a humanistic society. In 2003, George W. Bush reinstated the United States UNESCO partnership and said it would advance human rights, tolerance, and learning. Just a year later, in 2004, Bill Gates' Microsoft Corporation signed a contract with UNESCO to globalize education. The UN announced that the joint venture would foster web-based communities of practice, including content development and worldwide curriculum reflecting UNESCO's values. In 2010, Arne Duncan spoke at UNESCO's Paris headquarters and said, and Arne Duncan, if you don't know, is the U.S. Department of Education's uh, secretary. In March 2009, President Obama called on the nation's governors and state school superintendents to develop the standards and assessments known as Common Core. Then he said that states had done it without even thinking about it. He said, our goal for the coming year will be to work closely with global partners, including UNESCO, to promote system strengthening. Sounds like a global system to me. Crisis Magazine wrote that the terms college and career readiness and globally competitive workforce represent a gambit under the guise of education. They wrote, if it is a globalized world, then, the blurring, then blurring the lines of culture and country must be achieved in order, in order to ensure a cooperative workforce with fewer cultural divisions or religious tensions. A tractable workforce asks no questions because it has no foundation of knowledge from which to form the questions. <coughs> Hillstown College professor Terrence Moore wrote a book called Story Killers, where he details that America is no longer teaching students the great literary stories that foster an understanding of good and evil that enlighten the human mind and spirit. He said, the phrase global economy is misleading. Its use implies that it, America has never really been in a global economy, that it is new and different, so, 
somehow we need a new kind of education. He says that the Common Core's creators reveal their idolatry of technology when they state that its goals are to create students who are ready for college, workforce training, and life in a technological society. And this is in the uh, Common Core English Standards opening pages. He said, the Common Core tripod, tripod of federal standards, tests, and accountability are creating humanistic schools, clearly hostile to Christianity, the founding fathers in the Constitution, to traditional ideas of manhood and womanhood, to marriage and family, to the idea of America's unique example in the world, and any lesson about life and liberty that could be taught. And I just want to go back to that first story about my friend, the reporter, talking to the UN leader and their efforts to help people become self-reliant. What will this type of education mean for our children's ability to be self-reliant? I have lost faith in what legis legislation can do to help restore local education control. I think our government has gotten too big and unwieldy, but I have extraordinary faith in parents. When you go home today, find out if your children are using online resources that use common education data standards. Google IMS Global affiliates and members and any online platform that your children are using. For example, if your child uses Utah Compose, Google it with IMS Global and see what you find. But most importantly, recognize that we are the ones who would create, will create a vision of restoration for our children and for our country, a restoration of education founded on true principles. Our children are not test scores. They're not in economic inputs or outputs. They are blessings. I'm going to close with a bit of what I think is truthful marketing that I hope will give us all the courage to choose a better path for our children and our grandchildren. And I wish every one of you here today well in your quest. When you were a kid, what did you do for fun? So we'd go blueberry picking, for instance. Uh, just that's so cute. <laughs> but it was true. We grew watermelons, um, plantains. I found an old sign which was big enough for me to sit on and made a great toboggan. It was very slick and very fast. <laughs> I had a few fish in my basket and I looked up on this bluff and here's this black bear sitting there watching me. If he starts chasing me, I'm going to keep throwing the fish out of my basket until he's gorged that he won't, and he won't bother me. And what did you like to do for fun? Just, you know, you go door to door, get a group of kids and you play uh, lots of games, uh, hide and seek, just going out to the field and playing baseball. And we build these massive forts, you know, the kind that you can actually sit in and, and, and play in, you know, with, with our friends and it was just really wonderful. So what do you like to do for fun? Video games, definitely. I like to go on my phone, text, some email. My favorite thing to do in the world is definitely watching videos and playing video games. Those take up so much of my time. Three hours or t three to four hours a day. Same. Five hours straight. Just last week, I watched 23 episodes of a TV series in less than four days. I forget. I'm in a house, I have parents, I have a sister, I have a dog, I just think I'm in the video game, I completely get lost. I would die if I don't have my tablet. Whenever I feel upset, I'd play video games and I'd feel normal. It's really wonderful. When your daughters grow up, your great-great-grandkids, what do you think will happen if this trend continues? It's scary to think that they'll never have to leave the house. 
Cindy grew up uh, doing a lot of the things that I did and, and enjoyed. And I see what uh, my grandsons are doing today, and it's, uh, it's mind-boggling. By the time they have kids, it's going to be a really different environment. I actually feel a little sad because I feel like he's missing out on what's out there mm -hmm. in the beautiful world. special connection with nature. I think it's innate in all children, but needs to be nurtured. I'll just read this one off for Jaquel, and then uh, if you have a question, we'll take that. Uh, so here's the first, first question. You've lost faith in legislation. What do you suggest we pursue to affect change? My, my personal feeling is that um, what we're doing here today is the most important thing we could be doing, is figuring out what it is for our family that we want and then making that happen. I don't think that if we wanna be a self-reliant people with a free government, that we keep looking to our legislators to solve our educational problems. I think that a group of people has to rise up and say and create that better vision for what a, a, a wonderful, fulfilling, soul-stirring uh, soul education looks like for children and then provide that better path. So I, that's, that's my hope, is that you know, people here today will be inspired to find out what that is for their own families, and then may, maybe join forces with other families, and then we build that system, that agency-based education system that becomes you know, a better way. And other people will recognize, will recognize that they wanna to go towards the light instead of keep building onto a system that's not working. Numerous public school teachers do not recognize the dangers in what they teach, Common Core. How can we help them open their eyes? This kind of goes back to my first answer. Um, the difficulty I see, uh, let, let me go back to that story about the Columbus Day lesson uh, in my local school. The, eighth, the main eighth grade teacher, apparently, that kind of put that together is very young. And... Um, uh, one of the moms that spoke to her and the principal after the lesson was given said that she was actually super shocked. This teacher felt really bad that this mom felt like her uh, beliefs were being challenged at school. But she's young. She's growing up in this technological society where, hey, I get this curriculum given to me and it's going to meet the standard and it's going to help me score well, you know, my students score well on these tests. So it's just a prepackaged system. And so I, I'm not sure that there is a way. Um, the Canyon School District has now 35% of their teachers are relatively new. Um, I think that's only going to increase as the federal school turnaround measures get put into place. State superintendent, our state superintendent has been through that training in all school districts in Utah. So when we're not meeting test scores, we're just gonna see these younger and younger teachers come in and replace our older teachers who have a knowledge of history. So this is why I think it's so important that parents and families have to create another system. So how many legislators have you met with over the last three or four years? <laughs> Seems like almost all of them. And with every one of our um, U.S. congressional leaders. Um, and what I, what I think I'm finding or feeling, and Oak might feel differently, he has a lot more patience than I do. Um, and a lot more hope and faith in people. <laughs> but I feel like their hands are sort of tied because, again, we're in a system uh, where policies come in from these think tanks, from the National Conference of State Legislators, and, hey, this seems like a really good direction to go. I don't see what the problem is, they'll say to us. And, and the reason why they don't see what the problem is is because they won't sit down and simply watch an hour's worth of a presentation. They want a sound bite. And the people that bring them policies all day long give them sound bites that sound really good. 
he asked, where is, where is the point of attack? If this, um, these philosophies sort of seep into our political structure, then where is the weak point? Um, I, I might answer that differently than you, Neil, but for me, <laughs> um, I, would, I would flip it, and I would just go back to that the, the strong point for America is that we have strong families for Utah we have strong families who are engaged in their children's learning. And so I think that's where the solution lies. We know our children, and we can rise up and provide something better for them than anybody else through personal revelation. So the question is, what is the ultimate goal of this federalizing and globalizing? I think the ultimate goal is profit. Because once you create a global, a global system and you kind of control the inputs and outputs of everything, then um, everything works out well for you as a global entity. Um, and, and as the Crisis Magazine pointed out, once you kind of convince everybody that we live in this globalized world, then everybody just kind of thinks of themselves as an input and an output for the economy. And uh, honestly, um, Bill Gates was in an interview, I think it was with The Guardian magazine about a year ago, where he said, uh, we need a global government. And the reason why he thinks that is because uh, he believes that we'll bring peace and sustainability to the world once we sort of equalize everything. Um, it's a UN-based philosophy. It's based on humanism instead of humanity. So I believe that's where we're going. He, he asked um, if we were able, to, if we were able as a state to get out of Common Core, w could we create something different? Yes, absolutely. We haven't had um, the will at our state school board or state office of education or through our legislators to actually do that. They're afraid of losing federal funding. Um, so again, I think that if they're going to be fearful of loss of money, that we can't be. We cannot think that all of our decisions at the local level need to be controlled by money, and we have to find a different way. She said our, our new state superintendent was somewhat of an independent thinker and um, wondering if we've lost him on this issue. Um, <laughs> I would argue that he was not an independent thinker. Um, he was marketed as an independent thinker, and I like him. I, you know, he talks about constitutional principles, and I believe him. But then the policies that he puts into place are absolutely the opposite of that. And um, one thing that I did research was that right before he was hired, he met with the governor's office, and this was all published in the Ogden Standard Examiner. Um, and he offered up to the governor's office a book, a blueprint which was the plan, his blueprint for reform in the state of Utah. And it's a book called Leveraging Leadership. And that blueprint is the race to the top blueprint. So it's corporations um, doing exactly what we're, you know, they like to think that they're doing the opposite of what the educational establishment is doing, but they're actually doing the exact same thing.